Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Startup Sense podcast. This is your host, Jonah Lupton. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to bring you a great episode as usual. If you get a chance, go subscribe on iTunes or Google Play so you never miss an episode. Today's guest is Karthik. Um, He is the co-founder of a company called Connect. They are based out of New York. They've raised about $33 million, just finished raising their Series B. Um, Company's about 50 employees, growing rapidly, and I'm excited to tell you what they do. Uh, Karthik, how are you, man? Hey, thanks a lot, Jonah. Really happy to be on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, So before we talk about Connect, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you were doing before you started the company? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, before Connect, I was uh, super unique. I was doing finance in New York, which is, I know, like super rare. No one ever does it. Trying to go against the grain. And uh, we were working at a quant hedge fund uh, called AQR Capital. Um, And my co-founder, who I met when we were in college, we were both interns at J.P. Morgan back in the summer of 06 when we thought, you know, finance was never going to go down. Uh, We thought we were going to be like millionaires by the age of 22. It didn't really work out that way. But uh, he uh, was a consultant at Oliver One, and so he did like financial strategy consulting. And so uh, we kind of came up with the idea for Connect when we were, uh, we were kind of just meet up after work, uh, kind of brainstorm ideas. And originally it was kind of based on his work experience because at Oliver Wyman, he would do a lot of these supply chain and procurement related projects for large Fortune 500 companies. And we would always kind of brainstorm about, okay, well, obviously, you know, the Bank of America's and Boeing's of the world can afford to spend money on fancy consultants to help them with purchasing and finding vendors and all this. But we wondered what kind of small and medium sized businesses did when it came to buying. And that's what kind of got us along the path of eventually starting Connect. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I've had this problem myself on a couple of businesses that I've started, you know, trying to find the right manufacturers, trying to find the right companies to source ingredients from. It's a painful process. There's really no, there's no transparency. Uh, there's no way to look up reviews and, and whatnot, ratings for these companies. So I understand the, uh, certainly the difficulties that small business owners have to go through. So, okay, take us back uh, three or four years when you started the business. I know you guys are part of the AngelPad Accelerator um, is that where the idea was originally born? I mean, you guys probably had the idea before you got into AngelPad, right? Yeah, exactly. So we uh, we had the idea before AngelPad. We actually kind of uh, launched the original kind of beta version of the product back in really, really early 2012. So luckily, my co-founder and I are both engineers by training. So once we kind of started talking to a lot of small business owners and kind of verified that the idea had some legs and we kind of saw that small business owners were really experiencing these pain points pretty intensely, we thought, okay, well, I guess we can build this thing. And obviously we were super naive about the whole thing. We thought, all right, we're going to build this thing real quick, you know, sell it in a month or two, and then we'll be chilling on the beach. It didn't exactly, <laughs> it didn't exactly happen that way. As it never really does. It's always way harder than you think it's going to be. Um, as a lot of the entrepreneurs listening probably know. But uh, yeah, so we were just kind of two guys in a coffee shop, kind of a scenario. Uh, we were actually working out of Argo Tea here in New York at 22nd and Broadway, in case anyone's familiar. That was like our global headquarters for a while. And uh, yeah, we built the product, put it out there, and we had the product running for around nine months or so before we actually got into AngelPad. But AngelPad was an amazing experience. Um, I think, you know, for us, the two of us at the time, we didn't have a lot of friends who were working on startups. We didn't have a lot of connections in the startup world. We didn't know many investors. And we were very kind of isolated in how we were kind of working on our, our idea. We would just kind of sit at this coffee shop and work on it heads down. And we weren't exposed to many other entrepreneurs. And it was really awesome to kind of be plugged into that whole world because we went out to this, uh, uh, the Bay Area and we did AngelPad. And every day there were 12 other companies that were amazing super smart entrepreneurs who are part of the program as well, kind of working with us. And, you know, we weren't competitive with each other in terms of our business. So it was really awesome to learn from them and everyone would give each other advice. And it kind of added a healthy amount of social pressure. So, you know, you kind of, uh, kind of had a little bit of a, a push to kind of want to work on your, on your company a little bit more because, you know, you wanted to be the one who raised the most among your class or you wanted to kind of have a successful company among your best. So that was really awesome, I think. Did you guys, um, while you're at AngelPad for those few months, did your idea change or shift at all? 
or did you essentially leave angel pad with the same idea that you came in with? Ooh, yeah. Good question. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of people, uh, when they go through an incubator and accelerator, their ideas kind of pivot a lot. I guess we got lucky in that we didn't really pivot too much. In fact, since the beginning of um, our company, I wouldn't say that we really have had a major pivot in any sort of way. I mean, there've been little, little changes and obviously like, you know, thousands of little iterations along the way, but yeah, I mean, through AngelPad, we didn't really change direction that much. Um, we definitely accelerated growth and we became smarter about how we thought about, you know, whether it was acquisition or product or design or what have you, but yeah, we didn't change much in terms of the direction of the company. Um, yeah, but I think we got a lot smarter about uh, how we thought about our business, how we thought about the long-term uh, value of our business and kind of how we, uh, I guess, thought about product in general. Because I think there were some really, really great product minds among the entrepreneurs who are at AngelPad. And uh, the director of AngelPad, Tomas Corte, has got a really awesome kind of product uh, sensibility about him. So we got a lot smarter about product when we were there. So Connect is essentially a platform that connects small businesses to suppliers. So that's kind of the marketplace concept, which is not easy to build. I mean, you have to build the supply side and the demand side. So how did you guys get started with that? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Honestly, anyone who's listening out there who works on a marketplace or who's interested in marketplaces, I mean, you totally hit the nail on the head. That is that chicken and egg problem is really the crux of, of building a marketplace, right? And, and every marketplace is different in that respect. Um, for us, the, it, at least what we found initially is that it, the onus was more on us to kind of get the, the demand side, the small businesses platform, because once we had small businesses signing up, they buy so many things um, and the dollar value of those purchases is so high that it's not that hard to kind of get suppliers to sign up to get the opportunity to actually submit quotes to those buyers. It's not like, you know, we have people, individuals who are like, you know, creating a request for a $5 pair of mittens or something. And, you know, it's not really possible to get people to sign up just so that they could potentially submit a quote for a $5 thing. Whereas, you know, if you have a small business that's looking to buy a $50,000 piece of equipment, it, a lot of suppliers are very much interested in kind of, uh, you know, taking a look at that opportunity. So um, the chicken and egg problem wasn't that drastic for us, um, as, at least as we thought it was going to be. Um, but it's always something you got to watch out for. And I think aside from the chicken and egg problem, just generally managing liquidity uh, is always kind of something that's top of mind. And that's, that's the case for any marketplace. Like if, if a small business creates a request on our site and they're looking for quotes, and we don't get them enough quotes from the right suppliers in the right amount of time, then it's kind of a moot point to wonder why they won't come back, right? It's kind of like if, if, if you were using Uber and you tried to request a ride and the car doesn't come ever, then are you really ever going to use it again? Probably not, right? And on right. the flip side, when you think about a marketplace like Craigslist, you know, they have the best liquidity you know, possible, right? I and mean, you create any random request on there and you get 40 people replying. Certainly, people aren't using Craigslist because it looks good, right? So that's always an important thing to think about when you're building a marketplace is maintaining healthy liquidity. So. Now, in order for you guys to create that early demand, did you stick to a specific industry or and or did you start in a certain region like the Bay Area, like New York? Um, how did you guys kind of get the ball rolling? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so we didn't really focus on – uh, specific geographies, at least within North America, we're kind of, uh, we started off pretty expansive in terms of how, uh, like our geographic focus, um, but we did focus on a few verticals and we've kind of operationally been very much focused on a vertical by vertical kind of an approach because, you know, as we talk about maintaining liquidity, it's really hard to, you know, keep healthy liquidity for any product ever, right? I mean, you, so we started off with just kind of handling breweries and brewery requests, and then we kind of expanded, um, you know, month by month, year by year to adjacent verticals, and we've kind of expanded to a lot of verticals by now. But um, yeah, initially, we just started off with kind of breweries and microbreweries, and we kind of went from there. But that was important because you don't want to spread yourself too thin. Right. Uh, you know, you, you want to make sure that you can maintain that healthy amount of liquidity. Um, but at the same time, you want to build your product 
so that it's like radically horizontal in terms of its applicability. So, you know, that's always kind of been something that's top of mind for us. The thinking about a generically applicable product, but also thinking about more vertically oriented operational plans. And founder of the Lupton Group and host of the Startup Sense podcast. Are you struggling to find the right tech team to build your company's website or mobile app? Maybe you've developed a product but need help with your go-to-market strategy, including branding and marketing. Well, stop worrying because my team at the Lupton Group can assist you with all of those needs. We specialize in helping entrepreneurs and startups of all sizes launch and grow their businesses. For a free consultation, you can email me at jonalupton at gmail.com or visit our website at luptongroup.co. Now that you guys have been going after this for four years, what has been the, the most important or the, the most robust category or industry for you? I would say just generally speaking, food and beverage production. So, you know, a lot of beverage makers and food processors are platform and, uh, you know, they really kind of make a lot of their purchases through us and interact with a lot of their suppliers through us. And uh, that's been pretty cool to see. And we've gotten such a deep penetration in, in those verticals. So. so essentially, if I'm starting up a restaurant, I can come to your platform and source my equipment, um, a lot of the food necessary, The I mean, everything tables, I mean, all yep. that stuff, H- right? HVAC equipment, supplies, the machinery. Yeah. And if you're, if you're starting, uh, you know, if you're a food, food maker, if you're a food processor, if you're a brewery, winery, uh, any company like that, a bakery, uh, we got, we got the, uh, we got the stuff for you. We can help you find the best suppliers out there for exactly what you're looking for. Um, and that's kind of one of the interesting things that I think, uh, is really different about B2B, purchasing versus consumer purchasing, right, is that um, when you're a consumer, you're usually looking to buy pretty standardized things in low volume. So one blue Nike hat with a certain SKU number or, you know, some book with a specific ISBN number or something. And so it's pretty easy to find that stuff on Amazon or eBay or Walmart or what have you and easily compare prices. But for businesses, whether they're small businesses or large businesses, they're looking for things that are pretty custom in nature. It could be custom equipment or custom machinery or bulk supplies, like they're buying it in a bulk quantity or something where the pricing is opaque and it's not necessarily something that can so easily be represented just in a catalog form. And so when you're thinking about, hey, I'm a small business and I need to buy XYZ product and I need to find a supplier, it's actually really difficult to figure out who are the suppliers that can actually sell to you based on your geography, what your requirements are, all that good stuff. So we kind of helped that bridge that information asymmetry. So that was kind of the original impetus for starting the site in the first place. Cool. Um, so what's the policy if I come to the site and, you know, enter request for a specific need that I may have from, you know, I'm looking for a supplier for X, Y, or Z, and you guys don't really have any suppliers in that category. Uh, will you contact me and say, listen, we just, we can't really help you right now. Or will you go out and try to find suppliers to fill that need? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a constant challenge. You know, it's something that, uh, you know, we face, you know, every single day, there's always these random requests that come in. Um, but I think you have to be disciplined about it. And I think we've gotten really smart about how we, you know, manage that process over time. I mean, I think the first thing is when you have more of an, uh, a vertically focused uh, operational approach, um, you know, you tend to get less and less of those kind of totally out there requests, right? I mean, if you're, if you have a focus on say food processing companies, it's probably unlikely that randomly they're going to, you know, request quotes for, I don't know what, right? Like, you know, like a Ferris wheel or something, right? I don't know. So, uh, you know, they, they, you kind of have a sense for um, what, like, restricted area the product category, the, the requests are going to come in in terms of product categories. So that's been helpful for us. Um, but, yeah, every now and then you get a random request that you can't fulfill easily. And, obviously, we try to make sure that we communicate that to our buyers effectively and say, hey, this is kind of a random request there aren't really a lot of suppliers out there for it or, Hey, that's not really something that we cater to, but we know these suppliers exist. You might want to contact them. So we always try to make sure that the experience is not, um, you know, totally crappy from the buyers. Then we try to do as much as we can, but it's also important to make sure you have a good kind of data monitoring system so that you can track those requests. And, you know, something that was weird with the first time you saw it 
may not be so weird anymore the hundredth time you see it, right? It's like now that actually becomes something that's becoming more commonplace among your buyer base, and you might want to start getting suppliers for it. So I think you have to be smart, and it's obviously, you know, you have to kind of decide what your threshold is there where once you want to start looking for suppliers. But, uh, yeah, it's something we monitor a lot. And every marketplace kind of has to think about that to some degree. So, How has the customer acquisition strategy changed over the last four years from when you guys bootstrapped to when you're part of AngelPad to when you started raising money? And then certainly as you guys have raised now $33 million, I'm sure things have, have certainly scaled up. But maybe you can tell us about that more. No, man, we acquire our businesses the same way. It's just me and my co-founder just calling up people. <laughs> we, <laughs> I'm sure in the beginning it was, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. You don't even know, man. So we were we were in, uh, you know, like I was saying, we were in these coffee shops when it was just two of us. And, I mean, I, you want to talk about just pure hustle. I mean, we we were just calling up these small businesses and these suppliers, the both of us, you know, and just manually and, I, I'm telling you, it's so crazy because even today, I mean, it's been years later, but I remember all the conversations and I even remember like the user IDs in our system for these different suppliers. Someone will say, oh yeah, this, this supplier just submitted a quote and I'll be like, oh yeah, I remember that guy, user ID 5. Yeah, he signed up in 2012, March. Like I remember I was in the Time Warner Center trying to have a quiet phone call to that guy, <laughs> you know, on like the third floor. Like you remember these things because there were so few users back then. And every conversation was like a do or die kind of thing. And you just have to hustle to get every single person to sign up. And, uh, you know, obviously now it's a lot different, uh, luckily for us. But, yeah, I mean, in the early days, there was a lot of hustle. There was a lot of cold calling. There was a lot of, um, you know, just manual emails. We just had to figure out how to get users to sign up at all for this, right? Pretty soon we started to get smarter about how we could start scaling up our acquisition on both sides, both supplier side and buyer side. Although I think the onus on us has been to scale up with the buyer side a lot more than the supplier side. We can kind of afford to be a little bit more hands-on with the supplier side acquisition. But on the buyer side, yeah, we started doing a lot of experimentation over time with doing more email marketing, with trying out different strategies. And then once we got money for our seed round, we were able to kind of spend a bit more money to do more experiments, whether it was going to a trade show or what have you. And obviously, by this point, uh, we have like a full functioning market uh, marketing team with an awesome head of marketing. And, you know, they really try out a bunch of different channels and they have a whole multi-channel strategy and it's pretty awesome. And it's all, you know, it's, uh, it's totally humming. But before it was pure experimentation and pure hustle. And that's kind of what you need to do, right? I think um, before you try to scale up and automate things, uh, prematurely, you have to really make sure to, I think it helps a lot to get on the phone with your users and just find out really how they tick. And uh, yeah, I mean, just I think that was actually really helpful for us to do that early on. Which marketing channel do you think has had the best ROI overall? Ooh, good question. Um, I think, I mean, I, I, I guess some successful channels for us have been, I think, like organic, organic search has been really helpful for us. Um, you know, there's just a lot of small businesses who are kind of looking around for, you know, getting help with purchasing as they're getting a little bit more tech savvy. They're doing a little bit more searching online, but they can't really find any resources out there. Uh, and so they kind of find us and, and uh, you know, that ends up being a good way that we acquire a lot of users. And then word of mouth has been pretty powerful for us because, um, you know, within the verticals that we're focused on, I think a lot of these small business owners, they talk to each other a lot. You know, they have a pretty tight knit community and they've started to kind of tell each other, Hey, listen, these guys are really helpful and they've helped us out with a lot of our purchases. You guys should check it out. And so that buzz is really helping us out. So, um, yeah, I think those are two channels that have worked out really well for us. So how do you guys make money? Do you make money on every transaction or do the suppliers pay a fee to be part of the, the marketplace? How does it work? Yeah, so uh, we uh, charge the supplier side, um, and they, the suppliers, uh, in order to kind of um, have access to the platform and be able to, like, quote these buyers and also maintain relationships with the buyers and manage their uh, reorders and payments from the buyers um, over time, they pay a platform fee plus a uh, commission on the sales that they make through the platform. So okay. that's kind of how we, how we make money. Talk to us about fundraising. Um, I know you've had a lot of experience with this, certainly when you were 
in the investment world, you probably encountered this a lot, but uh, what's it been like raising money for Connect? I mean, what have been the difficulties and you know, how did you how did you raise thirty three million? I mean, that is a, a significant amount of money. <laughs> I'm so smooth, man. Right? I mean, you're talking to me now. You tell me. Um, you know, no, I think like uh, it. I mean, fundraising is. I think fundraising. Obviously, I I really don't like fundraising, and I don't think any entrepreneur does. But I think that fundraising is an interesting kind of test of uh, how well you can think about your business and then sell your business and pitch your business. I think as a founder, um, the natural tendency is to kind of overanalyze and really try to like um, really dive into the nitty gritty weeds of your business uh, just naturally because you're always caught in the weeds, right? And you care a lot about those nitty gritty details and every little thing matters so much to you. And every founder thinks that their business is so damn nuanced and, oh my God, I got to share all the details with you. And you don't, you know, I need you to understand how complex my business is. And I totally get that. But I think fundraising and interest is an interesting test of, can you helicopter up and put yourself in the investor's shoes and think about what drives them and what motivates them to want to invest in a company like you and think about, hey, what is the, what is like a quick, you know, couple minute pitch to get them excited about your business enough that they want to learn more, right? And you got to kind of think about what are the most exciting things to say about your business. If you had to describe your business really quickly, what would be the coolest thing about it as opposed to getting caught up and bogged down in like some of the things that you may think are interesting, but maybe a third party might not care. So I think that was a, it was a really good learning experience to kind of go through that during our seed round. And I think AngelFed helped us a lot with that because, you know, uh, as a lot of these accelerator programs do, they have a demo day at the end of the program and you only have, you know, four minutes to present during demo day. And so you don't really, in front of all these investors in this room, and so you don't really have a lot of time to kind of drone on. And so it's really about trying to figure out how do I kind of condense our business down into this nice morsel of information that gets people pumped about it and excited enough to approach us later and talk to us. And I think that really helped my co-founder and I really think about what is, like, how do we really think about this business? And if we have to condense our business into a couple of sentences, like, what will we really say about it? So that was helpful. I think the other thing to think about is, you know, fundraising is completely different depending on the stage that you're trying to fundraise for. So our seed round was just meeting a lot of investors. I mean, we must have, we met a bad amount of investors. You know, I, I want to say at least 70, to be honest with you. Uh, after how many investors, the day. So you met with 70 for, you know, to get your seed round. How many investors actually ended up being in the seed round? So we had about 12 investors in our seed round. Okay. So, yeah, there, you know, it's a lot of, you get a lot of no's and you get a lot of keep in touches that, uh, you know, never actually keep in touch. And that's fine, you know, and I think, um, but the seed round is, is very different dynamic than, say, Series A, you know, because Series A, you're starting to get a little bit more into the big leagues where investors are really putting down a lot of money in order to be your lead investor. You know, people are putting a couple hundred thousand dollars in or 50K in or 25K in. They're potentially writing a $5 million check, $7 million check, $10 million check. So they're holding you to a higher standard, not to mention you are no longer just pitching the dream, right? Because you actually have raised money, presumably, in your seed round. So now investors are like, hey, what did you do with that million dollars that right. you raised for your seed round? Right. You have so, some numbers to refer to. Exactly. So the pitch for Series A tends to be a little bit more meaty. It tends to be a little bit more quantitative. There's a, lo a lot more numbers that people expect you to dive into. Uh, and then, of course, for Series B, you know, it's just more and more of that. It's a lot more numbers, a lot more execution-oriented, a lot more, you know, kind of holding you to a higher standard when it comes to figuring out whether it's monetization or unit economics, having more clarity on that, really, you know, checking if you understand how you're going to scale and obviously how you're going to use that money. Whereas for the seed round, I think there's more importance on the you know, size of your market and how intense of a problem you're trying to solve. Uh, you know, like if you have a massive target market and this is a huge structural problem that absolutely needs to be solved, 
that's the most important thing for the seed round. And then, I, in my opinion, at least, the next most important thing is, are you the right team to be tackling that, that space? You know, do you know everything there is to know about your market? Do you understand the competitive landscape? Have you thought about every angle that's, that's going on there? And then I feel like the last thing, in the, you know, that's more tertiary for the seed round, at least in my experience, is exact product and traction. Because I think, especially for more sophisticated investors at the seed round, they're not really expecting you to have millions and millions and millions of users at that point in time. And they're not expecting you to be like, you know, generating millions of dollars in revenue before you even raise your seed round. They need to hope that if they give you some money for, in terms of seed capital, that you're going to be able to take that money and figure out how to make that into a home run business, right? So it's less about what you got now, and it's more about are you the right team that's tackling the right space that if they give you some money, they trust that you can probably figure out, you know, how to make that work. And so that kind of, um, that hand waviness, I think, goes away as you get more to Series A and Series B, because it's more about, hey, like, I like the pitch, and I like the dream, and I like the team, but uh, where's the execution? So I think that it, the, the kind of bar changes over time. Um, yeah. But... Uh, Man, you're good. You're answering my questions before I get a chance to even ask them. It's funny. I mean, I'm coming up with questions in my head and then you literally just answer them for me. So that's great. Because I was going to ask you, you know, how the pitch changed, um, you know, what, you know, from going from C round to A to B, you know, how, what, how, how you change the message to the investors. I think you did a nice job of answering that. And then I was going to ask you, you know, for the 80 percent of the investors that passed on the C round, what was the main reason that, th that they passed? Yeah. Um... I think for the seed round, uh, for a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm not just talking about us, but I think you know, for entrepreneurs in general, I think uh, a lot of the times it, seed investors pass because you can't really articulate effectively the size and kind of potency of your target market. Um, I think it's really, really important for entrepreneurs to appreciate that. You know, what a, and it's a great thing to be introspective about. Okay, great. So I'm building a, you know, there's a difference between what you're focused on right now because you're two guys in a coffee shop or, you know, two girls in a coffee shop or whatever versus what your big vision is and what your real target market is and what you're trying to achieve. Like if you're focused right now on Indian food delivery on Lexington Avenue in New York, that's awesome because, you know, obviously you only have a couple people at your little startup. So you're not going to be focused on every single thing in the world. But if investors think that that's the only thing you're ever going to focus on, then that becomes a not exciting market for them. If they think that you're using that as a sandbox to figure stuff out so that you can then capture all food delivery ever in, in you know, the entire world, okay, now we're talking, right? And so you, you, it becomes like a shift in how investors perceive you from, oh, these guys are not really that ambitious. And so there's not really that much room for screwing up. You know, they either, you know, there's only one path to figuring out the execution here. And even if they do it 100% well, it's not going to be an exciting market. It shifts from that to, oh, my God, this is a really ambitious, potentially game-changing, uh, you know, company. And, wow, they're actually being really smart about it by starting with an interesting beachhead. That makes sense. So it's a nuanced kind of uh, difference in how investors perceive you, but it's an important one. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs um, just end up falling short on that. And, uh, you know, it's just something you kind of sometimes have to learn the hard way. Uh, but, yeah, I think that's an important thing to, to think about. How has your role with the company changed over the last three or four years, you know, as you guys have grown from, you know, two people to 50 plus people? Oh, yeah. I mean, it has changed so much night and day. Uh, it's It's really been one of the most, I think surprising thing about just our whole startup journey. And I mean, the whole, the whole journey of just, you know, starting connect and then building it to where it is today is it's like full of surprises and, and the ups and downs and the whole roller coaster of emotions, obviously. Um, but I think one of the most surprising things has been how my role and my co-founder's role has kind of changed over time. Um, because when we first started out, I mean, you're just two guys sitting there doing everything, right? I mean, my co-founder and I coded up the original version of, uh, of the site, the first prototype. We were making all the phone calls. We were making the customer support calls. 
we were doing everything, you know, taking the trash out, everything, right? Uh, we were everything. Uh, and then as we started bringing people on the team, even through, you know, five, six, seven people right after our seed round, we were still doing a lot of stuff, like, you know, that was basically, you know, just, just like we were, um, you know, we were like normal engineers at the company, right? Like I was doing a lot of back-end coding. He was doing a lot of front-end coding. And there was a lot of kind of nitty-gritty hustling work that we were doing. And that's what you need to do, right? And that's totally fine. But I think as the company grew, uh, our roles started to shift more to be kind of leaders and managers, I guess, right? And you have to start thinking about a lot more kind of strategic issues, a lot more people-related issues, a lot more team management-related issues. Um, and you have to think more about coordination between people, things that, you know, you wouldn't have to think about before when you were five people sitting in a wee room, right? And, uh, you know, so that kind of started shifting. I think once we got to about 20 people or 25 people, you know, the, you know, the, the shift in our, our roles really started to kind of solidify and we really started to do a lot less kind of nitty gritty work and we were less in the weeds and we were trying to think a lot more about kind of more high level things. And at this point, now that we have about 50 people, I mean, we're very much out of the weeds. We kind of are thinking a lot more about high level strategic things. Um, we kind of depend on a, a management team to kind of help us, you know, get a sense for where, what the company is working on and what needs to be done and, you know, what the right strategy should be going forward. And we kind of, you know, have a lot, uh, th there's a lot more that you have to kind of delegate and, and, and trust people, you know, to actually work on, right? Because in the, in, in the beginning, everything is relying on you. But now we're at the point where you need to just be able to hire the right people who you can trust absolutely to run things and keep you up to date on what you need to know and you need to delegate. Otherwise, your company is never going to be able to scale. Um, and that's a challenging thing. I mean, look, I, I deal with issues related to that. So does probably every founder out there because you kind of feel like, okay, this is my baby. Uh, kind of from a, you know, it's like the, psych the psychology of it is really interesting and you're like kind of letting go. But at some point you have to recognize that, you know, it's actually better for your company if you find the right people and then delegate it to them, you can't be the best person at your company to, to do certain things. Otherwise, your company is just going to be hindered in terms of its ability to progress. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and you got to realize that your value to your company is lies in you thinking about more high-level things, whether it's strategic partnerships or whether it's hiring or thinking about organizational structure or what's the vision for the company, what's the next big area of expansion for you guys. That kind of stuff is, are, are things that no one else is going to think about if the founders aren't thinking about it. And so if you're wasting your time, you know, doing some nitty gritty stuff or, uh, you know, tweaking pixels or whatever it is, or pushing some code, you're going to miss that and you're going to, that's going to hurt your company. So yeah, it's a whole learning process. I, it's been, uh, it's been pretty interesting. If you could go back a few years and, and do one thing differently, what would it be? What? like the toughest question ever, man. Are you kidding? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, you can, you can name a few things because I'm probably, you know, any startup founder could probably rattle off a whole bunch, I'm guessing. Oh, my God. If we could do one thing differently or a couple things differently, huh? Um, well, I think in the early, early days of Connect, and I mean like early, like my co-founder and I sitting in a coffee shop here in New York, you know, just the two of us, uh, I think I would probably start there and say that I would be a lot less paranoid about getting advice from other founders and talking with other founders, trying to, you know, um, just kind of just connect with other entrepreneurs. I think, it, I don't know if it was coming from the finance world, which was, is naturally a little bit more of a paranoid kind of, kind of field where, you know, it's kind of awkward if you're seen talking with people you know, from competing hedge funds or competing private equity shops or whatever. Um, I don't know if it was that or just, you know, our own kind of uh, just naivete about the, the startup scene. But I think we kind of felt like, well, we're working on our startup and we don't want to reveal secrets to other people, you know, who are working on their startups. And I think you quickly realize that no one cares. You know, no one's going to steal your idea. Like, trust me, first of all, your idea is probably not that good anyway. And anyway, like the idea that you have 
if it's something that someone can have a quick coffee with you and steal and do better than you, maybe you want to go back to the drawing board, son. You know, <laughs> you might need to check how you're, how you're executing. So you start realizing that you actually have a lot more to gain from learning from other entrepreneurs, finding out what mistakes they made. And people are so helpful in the tech community, i found, and there's a real pay it forward kind of culture. And you really want to take advantage of that. And you can actually avoid a lot of mistakes that you probably don't need to make. Like you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and I think when you kind of are caught up in this like quote unquote stealth mode kind of mentality where you're like, I, I can't even tell my mom what I'm working on, you know? I don't know if she's going to steal my idea. <laughs> then you end up get, kind of making a lot of the same mistakes that other people have made in the past. And so I think that's one big thing that I'd probably tell, tell myself if I could go back in time. Uh, yeah, and I guess if I could go back in time, I'd probably do a lot more cool things than just go talk to myself back in 2012. I'd probably do some Marty McFly type stuff. So, uh, when it comes to recruiting, what have you found to be kind of the, the toughest positions, the hardest people to find? The hardest people to find. I mean, or even, or, I, even, or even the most competitive. I mean, whether it's engineering or really, really good salespeople or marketing people. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, I think, um, I think, I think it. Uh, the, the hardest roles to find in New York have been, for me, have been kind of people who have many years of experience running teams uh, in any functional area. It could be product, it could be marketing, it could be sales, it could be anything at, at big, high-growth tech companies. That's kind of been the hardest thing for us because, you know, there aren't a lot of those companies in New York that have, you know, years and years of successful track records where, you know, they have hundreds of people and there's kind of a good uh, layer of managers that you could draw upon to kind of help you run your teams, right? I think there's, there's much more companies like that um, in, uh, in the Bay Area. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that those roles have kind of been the hardest. And so, you know, it, we really did a pretty kind of, uh, I guess, considered search for a head of marketing and a head of accounts and, you know, for a lot of these kind of senior roles. And that was kind of hard um, for us. So what would you say are some of the biggest goals for the company in 2017? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, we're excited about a few really, really big kind of initiatives uh, at the company uh, that we're kind of all rallying towards. I think one big effort for us is really making sure that for both our buyers and our suppliers, the reordering process is really seamless. I think that's a big pain point that a lot of our users uh, over the past couple of years have really been uh, kind of telling us, and they're really clamoring for kind of a better solution when it comes to being able to, um, you know, reorder from existing suppliers and existing relationships that they have, manage their um, communications, invoices, payments for all their suppliers in one central place, and kind of make that process more seamless and more trustworthy. So that's a huge push for us in the first half of the year. Um, and we're really pretty excited about that because it's not only going to help our users, but it's also going to really improve user engagement for us. Um, and I think another big area of um, kind of focus for us in the first half of the year is going to be um, really using a lot of the uh, valuable insights and information that we have on our buyers to improve the way that we re-engage them. Uh, just in the same way that kind of Amazon is really good about, you know, kind of guessing the different products and, and uh, things that you might be interested in based on what you bought previously. I think we have a lot of really awesome, really rich data on our buyers and what their preferences might be, what they might be looking to buy in a few months based on what industry they're in and what season it is and all those kinds of things. And so uh, I think we're, we're pretty pumped to actually use more of that data um, to kind of, yeah, just do a better job of, of keeping top of mind for our buyers. Um, and that's kind of something that our data science team and our marketing team is working really hard on. So yeah, a couple, couple of really exciting things um, that we're rallying the company around, uh, at least in the first half of 2017. So it should be a good year. We're pretty excited. Cool. Um, so I think over the last few years, it's been proven that certainly some of the more successful startups, whether it's Airbnb, uh, Uber, 
you know, TaskRabbit, Etsy, they're all kind of built around this marketplace concept. That's certainly mm-hmm. what some of the guys are doing too. So for some entrepreneur, if some entrepreneur came to you and bought your lunch and sat down with you and said, hey, what advice would you have for me before I go out and try to build a marketplace in, in this niche or this industry, what would you tell them? Ooh, um, to build a marketplace, huh? <laughs> Building marketplaces is tough. I'd probably try to uh, warn them against it, I guess. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, if they really were adamant about it, I think a couple of things. So I, I think one thing is, above all else, you have to, when, you, when you're building a marketplace, you have to focus on liquidity. That's the crux of the whole thing, man. Like, uh, and when I say liquidity, for different marketplaces, that means different things. Um, for, say, Uber or Lyft, their definition of liquidity might be, hey, what percentage of ride requests does a car arrive within four minutes or five minutes? Um, for eBay, it might be something different. You know, how many bids are placed in the, in the you know, in the first hour or whatever it is. Or uh, for Connect, it's, it's, pro- it's something related to, like, the number of quotes that we're able to get, a uh, number of high-quality quotes that we're able to get from the most relevant suppliers for a given RFQ. Um, and so if you can't kind of meet those uh, bare minimum kind of set of conditions where a buyer would say, hey, this place is, you know, it has good liquidity, um, and they're actually providing me the liquidity that I'm looking for, then it's a moot point to wonder why they wouldn't come back, right? Like if you used Airbnb to try to find a place to stay in Austin, say, and you couldn't find one, I mean, are you really going to be excited to go try to use it again? Like if you tried using Lyft to get a car and the car never came, I mean, why would you ever use it again, right? So, uh, and if you want to look at it on the flip side, think about Craigslist, right? Craigslist is an extremely liquid marketplace. Um, it's famously liquid. Like you put a random request on there, uh, random posting, and you get like 40 people replying, and you're like, I didn't even know there were that many people in the world who cared about this thing, uh, let alone my neighborhood, right? But that's the beauty of it. That's the power of it. That's the true marketplace. And certainly no one's using Craigslist because, you know, it looks good. I mean, it looks like, uh, uh, I mean, it's like a total like relic of the 90s, right? I mean, it doesn't, it looks like shit, <laughs> but, no, but people worst, use it. And UI ever. Yeah. Oh my God. Totally. Uh, but that's the thing. Like marketplaces at the end of the day are built to connect two sides, to connect demand with supply. And if you do that effectively and you bring the right supply to that demand, that, you know, forgives a lot of other sins that you have in terms of UI or whatever else. So that's the crux of a marketplace. And that's really something that, uh, one of our early investors, Naval Ravikant from Ageless kind of advised us on. He, he, he kind of gave us that advice back in the day. And I'm always grateful to him for that because he said, listen, there's a lot of little, uh, you know, widgets and, uh, and little doodads and fancy features you could throw on there. You might be tempted to do that because you might look at other marketplaces and see that they have all these cool little, uh, you know, features, but that doesn't matter. What matters first is, do you have liquidity? And that's been really helpful for us to focus on. That's what I would advise someone who's starting a marketplace. The other thing I would say is, if you're starting off building a marketplace and you're at a pre-seed stage, you know, you're a couple, couple of people sitting in a coffee shop kind of a deal, I think the most important thing to prove is that there is an existence of demand, there is an existence of supply, and they have a really tough time finding each other um, if it weren't for you. I think that showing that latent demand and showing that you can actually facilitate that connection even if it has to be done manually, it's totally okay early on, uh, at least in my opinion. Like, I think too many early stage marketplaces that I see, they get too caught up in this, like, you know, automation game where they're trying to automate everything and trying to scale everything up and trying to, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to, like, kind of, uh, like, run before they can walk, you know? I think a lot of the most successful marketplaces, if you read about their history, you know, they basically found some demand, found some supply, and they manually connected that demand with that supply initially just to at least prove to themselves that, hey, there's a lot going on here. There's a, there's a huge opportunity. Once you do that and you have a good understanding of your users on both sides of the marketplace, then you can automate the hell out of it. That's fine. But I think you got to be careful about not just like 
trying to automate something that really isn't there. You know, if you don't have an existence of demand and supply, then what the hell are you trying to automate? So, I don't know, just a couple of points of advice I would give if someone were starting a marketplace off early on. Absolutely, man. That's solid advice. So, last question for you here. Uh, I think this is an interesting one. I don't know if I've ever asked, I don't think I've asked this one before to anybody. Uh, with regards to getting feedback from, um, you know, your users, who do you think gives the better feedback? Is it the the user that signed up once, used the service, and then never used it again? Or is it the user that uses you guys on a more consistent basis? Hmm. Um, like who gives better feedback? Uh, yeah, who gives better feedback? Of, and, you know. and what's your process for getting that feedback? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, so I think I think there's there's value in in both types of feedback. So it's hard to say which is better or not. But I will say that um, it's a, a lot of times people tend to have uh, at least you know from from our own experience and also from you know some of my friends' experience running their startups. I think we found that collecting feedback from users. Um, is a lot more, it's, it's sometimes easier to do from users that might just use you like once or twice and then never come back. And that sounds surprising, but, you know, sometimes they have a really, you know, they have a strong reason for maybe not liking you or, you know, they might have a strong reason for liking you that initial time, but that they don't need to use you again. And so you're not really that worried about bothering them or pestering them, right? So you're like, you keep trying to get that feedback. And so sometimes your feedback, your pool of feedback from users can kind of be dominated by users that are relatively infrequent users. And I think sometimes people try to walk on eggshells when it comes to um, users that are actually very active and, and are repeat users uh, oftentimes. And it's also hard to kind of uh, keep collecting kind of uh, consistent feedback over time from the same user, right? Just like, make, like finding time in their schedule, coordinating that, so that you can kind of see how their opinion has changed of your site over time. That's really tricky logistically. And so I feel like people have less of that. Um, I feel like that kind of feedback is actually the most valuable, kind of getting the same user to give you consistent feedback over time. Um, I feel like that's, that's something that we really strive, strive to kind of get, especially when you're a startup, when um, your product is changing so frequently, especially early on and your user experience is changing a lot, you really want to see you know, how a user kind of responds to that as they've been on the site, right? And that, so I think that that kind of uh, feedback is uh, kind of a holy grail, at least for us. But yeah, I don't think that there's anything wrong with or specifically bad about users that you know, uh, just use you a couple times or once or twice and then they give you feedback. That's all that's helpful. I think uh, a type of feedback that uh, people really have a tough time getting, which is actually super important, is getting feedback from potential users that haven't signed up yet, right? And that's like really, really difficult to get as well. Um, it's like, you know, if you have users that haven't signed up for your service for whatever reason um, or haven't even heard of you and, you know, you kind of want to get their opinion of your service and uh, why they haven't signed up, why they don't care, why they don't think your service is actually useful for them. That kind of feedback is really useful, especially when it comes to, um, you know, thinking about how you want to change up your marketing and also kind of thinking about what product blind spots you have that you're not really, you know, you weren't really aware of. So I think, uh, you know, all these different types of feedback are valuable. It kind of putting them together gives you a good holistic picture of how, you know, your entire existing and potential user base thinks about your product. Um, and yeah, it's not easy to collect all this stuff. I mean, we, we have a customer success team that's really amazing that collects all, all the feedback that they get on their phone calls and via email, and we store that in our internal systems. Um, and our account management team and sales team uh, do a similar thing, uh, you know, on the supplier side of our platform. And, you know, we, we try to be as organized as possible in, uh, in kind of, you know, collating all the feedback together and kind of going through that feedback periodically um, with the PMs and with the different operational um, uh, people at our company just to make sure that we're staying on top of uh, kind of what's, uh, what's happening within the Connect zeitgeist, I guess. But uh, it's hard. You know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not easy. And I think it's even harder to make sure that you're not making decisions on 
like uh, kind of uh, uh, just random kind of observations, right? You hear one user saying something, uh, that doesn't mean that, that that applies for every single user in your user base, right? So making sure that you're keeping track of the specific issues and only kind of taking actions on it if it's really becoming a common theme, that's also tricky. So yeah, the, I guess uh, kind of a cop-out answer, but I guess in general, pretty pretty tricky. There's no like silver bullet answer, right? But it's definitely something that's important for a product center company to kind of be thinking about. So. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you, man, for the interview. Really appreciate your time today uh, and Friday for the people listening. They don't know that my computer crashed on Friday, so we had to finish up today. So I appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. What's the, what's the best way for people to connect with you or find you online? And, and of course, the company's website is connect.com, but how should they connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, so my email address is karthik at connect.com, K-A-R-T-H-I-K at connect.com. Um, definitely drop me a line. I love chatting with people, you know, whether you're like fellow entrepreneurs or people thinking about, you know, getting into the startup game or, you know, potentially people who want to work at connect. Like I love talking with people. Um, about our company. I guess if I didn't, that would be a huge life fail uh, on my end. So uh, definitely shoot me an email. Um, and like you said, our website is connect.com. We're based here in New York, in, uh, in Manhattan, near Madison Square Park. So if you're in the area, uh, you know, don't feel shy to stop by for a copy or something. Um, yeah. And thanks so much for the time, Jenna. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, just out of curiosity, what positions are you guys currently hiring for in New York? Yeah, so we're hiring for uh, for a bunch of things. I think the role that we're hiring for right now is uh, is a head of product role. So that's kind of a a big role that we um, that we're pretty actively trying to fill right now. And we're also looking for engineers. Uh, you know, which I guess is uh, everyone and their mother is always searching for engineers. I guess, but uh, the, yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, those are kind of two two big areas that we're, uh, that we're looking for people for. And we're also looking for a graphic designer in case. What, would your, what would your ideal head of product person look like? I mean, in terms of background Ooh. and experience. Yeah, that's a real question. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually a really, it's actually a hard question to kind of come up with even for yourself. Like I, we did a lot of introspection and a lot of thinking before we kind of put out our job description and started the search because that's an important question to ask, right? I think, um, some people kind of think about all product leaders as just kind of being the same, but there's, a, you know, some product leaders are a lot more um, execution oriented and they like rolling their sleeves up and getting their hands dirty with like sprint planning and, and uh, you know, actually executing on a roadmap. And some people are a little bit more interested in the strategy and uh, kind of thinking more high level and uh, working more on the, the vision for the product. So, it's kind of a spectrum of people. Um, we're kind of looking for someone, I think, who has a, a bent towards execution, um, especially because we're still relatively early stage. You know, we have about 50 people at the company, as you mentioned earlier in the, in the podcast. But, uh, um, you know, we're not some massive company uh, that just needs a lot of people sitting in, you know, offices kind of pontificating. We're still at the stage where, you know, we want someone who is pumped about product management, who loves rolling their sleeves up and getting their hands dirty with, you know, actually executing on our roadmap, uh, but who's also able to take a step back and kind of work with my co-founder and I to kind of think about, okay, how do we take the vision for the company and, uh, and make sure that uh, we manifest that into a strong roadmap and make sure that the company is moving towards that, you know, that North Star that we have for ourselves. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for. And I, I have a slight bias towards people who have uh, marketplace experience uh, previously. It's not 100% necessary, but I think that always helps in terms of helping people hit the ground running. So, yeah, that's kind of what we're looking for. So um, if anyone out there is interested or knows someone who might be interested, definitely let me know. Uh, I couldn't hurt to have a copy or a phone call. So always glad just to make the initial connection. Awesome. Yeah, I hope you find that person and maybe they're even listening to this podcast and they'll give you, you know, an email in a couple of days. That'd be great. Absolutely. That's okay, good. man. I want to thank you so much. Next time I get down to New York, we'll have to meet up for some lunch or coffee. And uh, until then, wish you the best and continue to success with Connect for, for the rest of the year. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. This was fun. You got it, man. Talk to you soon. Bye. Cheers.
Cheers.